Good morning, everyone. I am super excited to be here, of course. Uh, I find it kind of ironic that we're here at an academic institution because school never really liked me, and I never really liked school. I'm a pretty lucky guy today. I'm 33. I live in a massive penthouse. I walk to work. I drive a supercar to the movies. I work at an amazing business that's focused on making the world a better place with a bunch of inspired, passionate, intelligent people. In the last couple of years, we've grown the business from 12 million to this year we'll do more than 100 million in sales. There's a lot going on and it's happening really fast. I use I a lot in this talk, but it's really about we. and It's about the experiences of the people in my life that have come together that have given me a place that really represents the life of my dreams. I could retire, but I never would, because every day I do exactly what I love with amazing people. I had a party a little while ago. Someone at the party saw my annual goal list, and they came up to me and said, is this the bucket list for your life? I said, no, that's for the year. They said, impossible. I said, really? What if the impossible was actually possible? And that's what I'm going to share with you today, because it is. Impossible is just limitations we set for ourselves. And I'm no different than any of you. I've just had some unique experiences in my life that have pushed me through a, front, a few frontiers. Not willingly, mostly through force, but they've built me into a person today that sees no limitations in anything. I can remember the first time in my life that I discovered the impossible. I was sitting in the vice principal's office. You see, I was one of these kids that was crazy. I couldn't sit still. I'd try and sit at the desk, and I'd be talking to the person next to me. The teacher would go insane. I'd skip class a lot. Sometimes I'd go to the local university and learn. Other times I'd go to class, but I'd sit there and I would sleep. Teachers went nuts. And so I was in the VP's office, and he was saying, look, this behavior is just unacceptable. I remember walking in the office, there was the comfortable chair and the uncomfortable chair. You know the one that says you're in trouble? Some of us have sat in that one. I remember sitting down and him looking across the desk and the wrinkles in his face. I could just see, why are you not behaving? The issue was I wasn't doing homework and I wasn't going to class. And I thought, well, why should I go to class and have to do homework if I just have that kind of mind that can read a book and pick up the material? Why should I have to do all this stuff? I can get the tests. And we debated this for a little while, and then he leaned over and he said to me in a very serious tone, school is not about learning the material. It's about learning to conform. And that's when it happened for me. I felt it in my belly. It like built it, and it busted up, and it bursted through, and I knew that that wasn't the place for me. So I stood up and I walked out. And this began my life. The first day out of that was awesome. <laughs> no more school. Of course you're going to love that. I was in grade 9. I was 14 years old. So it was a party. Yeah. I actually slept in the first day. I think I slept in until noon. Then I hung out, did a bunch of things, watched some TV, went for a bike ride. After a couple days, mom said, okay, look, if you're going to stay here, if you're going to stay under this roof, you're going to have to get a job. So I got a little serious about that, picked up the newspaper, started making some phone calls. I didn't really think that not having work experience would affect me, but not having a resume or work experience was kind of an issue. Nobody called me back, nobody talked to me. After a week, I was starting to get a little bit discouraged, and after two weeks, I was beginning to consider that maybe I'd made the wrong decision. Anybody been in that position? Made a jump forward, tried something, and then lost confidence in yourself? I was there, and as the days went by, I became more and more unmotivated, sleeping in more, staying up all night. I just started to feel worthless. The hardest part was my mom, because I grew up with just my mom. She was a single mom, and her salary was just above the poverty line. She had sacrificed everything for me to give me an amazing life. Really, her success was all about me growing and developing and becoming an amazing human being. And she was watching me in bed giving up on myself. It got so bad that I wasn't even sure I was worthy of living. Of course, I went to the kitchen and ate my emotions out. I remember one bag of Doritos. It was 1.2 kilos. I was watching TV one night. I ate the entire bag. I 
think Doritos have something in them that like, you can't resist them. <laughs> so this went on. I became more and more depressed. And then one morning, I just kind of rolled out of bed in desperation. I thought, I'm going to go to the library. I'm going to find a book, maybe on building a better resume or how to get a job or something. And looking through the library, I came upon a very different book. This was a book written by a guy named Richard Branson. Anybody know him? <laughs> Created an empire called Virgin. And I got this book, and I picked it up, and as it talked about his life becoming a billionaire, I remembered what the VP said on the way out at school. He said, you're either going to end up on the street, or you're going to end up a millionaire. And now I had something different. I didn't like either of his choices, but when I found that book, I said, I'm going to be a billionaire. Do something big. Change the world. And I found an impossible mission. I went home, I was so excited, I barely slept. The next morning I was tired, but I jumped out of bed. And I picked up the phone, I started calling those same places, and I didn't stop calling until they let me down for an interview. I went to the office and I said, this is my job. They thought I was absolutely nuts. A 14-year-old kid applying to sell $10,000 dish sets at a trade fair. But they said, what the hell, give you a shot. So I went out the weekend and I was relentless. I hustled it all weekend and I ended up selling some dishes. And they said, wow, I became the boy wonder and they sent me around the United States. In fact, I was driving around middle-aged sales guys without a driver's license through the Cascade Mountains. I remember it. I'll tell you some other things that happened there another time, but <laughs> suffice to say I grew up fast. <laughs> so I was on the way in my career. And mm, this first job, I really focused and I learned to master it. And as soon as I did, I jumped and I took another job. I moved into car sales. And I became good at that. And then I got a phone call and I went into the internet to sell banner ads. It was an invitation to sell a couple hundred thousand dollars a year of banner ads and I got a percentage of whatever I sold. I rocked it. I dedicated myself 100 hours a week. I applied myself to this job. And in a little bit of time, at 17 years old, I was making $150,000 a year. Until one day, the CEO called me into the office and he said, we think you're making too much, so we're going to change your commission plan to be 0.5%. Still not bad for a 17-year-old, but I had a choice. Was I going to stay with it or jump off it? And so this is the first lesson of three around how to accomplish the impossible. I had the choice of whether I was going to stay on this train or jump off this train. And for me, it was about, let's jump off the train. Just like with school, it was very easy for me to stay focused with everybody telling me what to do. But to choose a life of achieving the impossible is very different. It's about, what do we want to do? What do we accomplish? And at that moment, when I decided to jump off the train, just like with school, I moved into a world of uncertainty. For a couple years, I struggled, and then I figured out how to start a business. $500 credit card turned into a $2 million business with 20 people by the time I was 21. And I applied, and I applied, and we grew. And I was winning all these awards, but I was empty inside. My expectations were just too much. Have you ever been there? No matter what you do, how hard you try, it's not enough. I put this goal on my list, align my business with my passion. We were selling products and marketing online, but it didn't really fulfill me. I thought it was about the business, but it was something much more. It was about me learning to love myself and accept myself. And this goal was up there on the list, and I missed it one year, and so I put it on my fridge, and I highlighted it and I circled it. And like, like most goals in our life, if we put them and we stick with them and we commit with them, they find a way to happen. I didn't expect the way this one was going to happen. It's often not that way. I went to a routine doctor's appointment, and it turned into a terminal cancer diagnosis. Who gets a terminal cancer diagnosis at 24? I had no idea what to do. Another impossible situation. I looked at this graph, they call it a Kaplan-Meier curve. 100% chance of survival at right now. And then a couple years in, it dropped off. There was this 10% chance of survival. I thought, great, it's not impossible. There's some people that survived this thing. But I called the researcher, and he said they all died. 
So this type of cancer I had, basically everybody died from. Another impossible mission. Another choice. Do I stay on the train or jump off the train? And this is the part about setting out on the impossible. We have to get really comfortable with the crazy things that are going to happen. Because they do. When we set out to achieve things that everyone says is impossible, it gets crazy. And so was I going to submit to everybody telling me that it was time to die? Or was I going to move into the fear and choose something different? Was I going to learn to consume the fear that comes in my life and be nourished and fueled by it? Step two to achieving the impossible is eat fear. What a crazy thing to say, eat fear. What does that mean? Most of us spend our life hiding from fear. When we encounter it, when we encounter someone that scares us, we just step back, just go somewhere else, talk to someone else at the party. When we feel it in our life, we hide. We just stay in bed or duck below it. It's all about resisting and moving away from fear for most of us. But if you want to achieve the impossible, it's about finding the fear, about sniffing it out, about moving into it, about feeling it, about diving into it. This is the choice. And so when I was diagnosed with a terminal cancer, was I going to prescribe and stay on the train or was I going to move into the scariest stuff? I said, hey, let's figure this out. If I could drop out of high school and start a business, then I can cure cancer without a treatment. There was no option, but I was going to figure it out. So I hired an MD, traveled around the world, flew everywhere. Airplanes, cue. <laughs> Met leading thinkers, researchers, healers, shamans, doctors, clinicians, read hundreds of books, thousands of papers, and I discovered a truth that was very different. A truth that if we are willing to look inside, illness can just go away. It sounds crazy. It sounds impossible. But that was what I found. And I said, instead of living a life that's average, I'm going to apply myself to be less average. I'm going to apply myself to the mission of impossible. And I said, if I'm going to die in a couple years, then let's set a goal out a few more years, something that's impossible also, that the vision of, the image of, that I cultivated, if I put it on the wall, it would become real. And so I said, I'm going to summit Everest five years after this terminal cancer diagnosis, which means I've healed, I've cured, I've somehow figured it out, I've become a vibrant, energetic person that inspires others. I'm going to go up, raise money for charity, and come down teaching other people how to do the same thing. This became my mission. I told everybody. I can only imagine what they thought when they knew I was going to die from cancer in a few years, and I said, I'm going to summit Everest in five. Oh, what a poor guy. He's got hope. Imagine, I could see it on their face actually. So I set out on this journey, and really, this relationship with fear became the theme of my life. Everything that scared me, I dove into. I used to throw up before I'd public speak. But I said, hey, if I'm going to share this story, Everest, and what I did, I'm going to have to get used to it. So I joined Toastmasters. Man, that was the most stressful thing. If, you, if you've been in, you know exactly what I mean. It is hell to get through 10 talks at Toastmasters if you're afraid of speaking. I was also afraid of singing, so I decided I was going to throw a 30th birthday party. I was going to do a charity birthday party, charge 100 people to show up at the birthday party. I didn't even know if anybody was going to show up, but raise money for charity and sing the first time in public in front of a couple hundred people or 100 and a bit. And so I did that, and at uh, the first singing lesson, I was sweating like crazy. Mm, I went on all kinds of adventures, and every experience of fear I dove into. And what I found in this process was really the third step to achieving the impossible, to changing and moving into a place where impossible becomes possible. Stop thinking. You're thinking right now. You're saying something. You're judging what I'm saying. He's real. He's full of it. <laughs> Is that, did that really happen? Some of you are pulling out your phones in the back. I see you. You're checking, Googling it out. Did that really happen? <laughs> yeah. It's that voice. So for me, when I said Everest, it came up and it said, dude, are you crazy? You're going to die in a few years. What are you talking about Everest? This is a silly idea. And even if somehow you were going to heal, do you want to be up on some glacier freezing your butt off? 
struggling away, training. You don't like any of this stuff. You never liked mountaineering and freezing glaciers. This is a stupid idea. You need to just save your money, give it to your mom, die in peace, you know, go to a warm island somewhere. Stop dreaming. It's impossible. That voice, that's the thinking. It comes up for all of us. As soon as we set out to do something, it pops up. Natter, natter, natter. So I had the choice that I want to follow that or not. But I feel so fortunate to have been on this path where people showed up and taught me the process, the experience, the discipline of settling in. Most of us in the room have probably tried yoga. That's a good way to start. There's meditation and there's a whole bunch of other practices. But those things that let us calm that voice, that let us find the center, because when we do, when we let go of the voice, we find something, something much more powerful than anything we could use to power our life. Our heart beat. Each of us, inside of us, have a dream. Frank in the front row, he's in accounting. He wants to be in marketing. What would you be if you could be anything? I'd be in marketing but I'm an accountant. I've already chosen my path. No. The heart has a call for all of us. And when we ignore it, it has a way of getting our attention. But if we can let go, if we can stop thinking and settle in, it comes out and it bursts into our life with an explosion of joy and love and peace and achievement and success. It teaches us that everybody in this crowd is just like me. We're all on the same team. I'm on your team. You're on my team. This world is ours, ours to create. The things I've seen and the people I've met, if I told you today, you wouldn't believe me. Beyond the world of possible that everybody shares are things that are absolutely unbelievable. They say truth is stranger than fiction. It is absolutely true. And when we stop thinking and we settle into the heart, everything becomes possible. Today, I feel so fortunate to work with an amazing group of people that are all focused on making the, better, the world a better place. At Zag Group, we focus on possibility. It's, in fact, it's one of our values. Impossible is possible. And somehow all these people show up that say, let's do it. We funded over 100 charities. We give a large percentage of our profit to contributing and making the world a better place. We've started three main profits. One of them is called Perception Medicine Foundation. I've written a book about my process. And in this foundation, we're collecting healers from around the world to disseminate how did what I experience happen? And how do we repeat that for others? How do we bring this truth of mind, body, spirit medicine to the world? I've said ambitiously that we're going to find five terminal cancer patients and film a documentary series bringing them through the same process that I used with this group and cure them of their cancer without medicine. Impossible, right? Possible. Everything is possible. At work, at Zag, we set out in our profit business to find plants that indigenous populations use to help make the world more peaceful. Plants that people consume that feel relaxed, happier, less stressed, to help calm the noise, stop the thinking, and settle into the heart. These businesses are not things that the power structure in the world wants. We face a lot of opposition on every front. There are trillions of dollars of economic incentive to keep things the way they are. Some would say our ambitions are impossible. They would probably say the same thing about the invite I received last week to hang out with Richard Branson on his island. Have I jumped off the train? <laughs> you bet. Am I eating fear? Absolutely. Have I stopped thinking and settled in the heart? Yeah. Because that is the place where the impossible becomes possible. Thank you.